Hello everybody, my name is Geared You, and welcome back to Let's Play Splatoon. In the previous episode, uh, we discussed the remaining weapons in the game. And in today's episode, we'll be discussing something that is no longer available in the original game, Splatfest. Now, this is something that was really cool that you could do in the first game um, during certain periods of time. Um, usually this would happen like once every month or every two months or something like that. So, so what the Splatfest was... Um, was that you could compete in a little competition in the game. You could pick a team and you could support it and uh, emerge victoriously. And you'd get like special rewards like Super Sea Snails, which you could use uh, to open up uh, item slots and reroll abilities um, and things like that. So oh, yeah, it was really fun and really cool. There were a couple problems uh, that I personally had with it, uh, which we'll be going over a little bit later in the video. Um, but as for right now, I have something very interesting to share with you guys. Um, the footage you're seeing on screen right now, the Spongebob vs. Patrick Splatfest, was the very first footage I ever recorded for this game. When this was announced, I had an idea that I would upload a video, like a very random special video, dedicated to just the Spongebob and Patrick Splatfest, and in the video, I would talk about like my random opinions of the game, and ask you guys if you want to ever see a Let's Play this. And the more I thought about it, the more I figured if I was to do an eventual Let's Play this game, it would make more sense uh, to uh, to have the footage of the Splatfest appear at that point. So that's what's happening right now. Well over a year after this video footage was recorded. <laughs> if you want an example of how long ago this was recorded, this Splatfest happened on April 23rd, 2016. Let that sink in for a moment. This was recorded before I got my new capture card. This was recorded before anything was recorded for The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker HD and Earthbound. So yeah, this footage predates my previous Let's Plays. I'm a crazy person. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, this was really fun and uh, this was something that I was planning on doing for a long time and if I knew that I was going to do Let's Play this game at some point, then I probably would have tried to have recorded footage for all the Splatfests. Um, that ultimately didn't happen, I only recorded for the last four Splatfests. My original plan was to make separate videos for the last four Splatfests, and as time went on and I got more advice from some YouTube friends, the more I figured it would be a better idea to have uh, uh, three of them appear in one video, and the very last Splatfest appear during the finale of this last play. You'll see why when we get to that point. Um, but as for right now, let's talk about how Splatfest actually worked. Now, like I said earlier, this was like a competition, and uh, a few days prior to it actually happening, you could go into the Inkopolis Plaza and go into a box uh, to pledge your vote. Um, Callie Murray would announce uh, the Splatfest whenever uh, one would actually appear. I think it would appear on social media before that happened, but believe it or not, it actually wasn't all that big on social media prior to this actually happening. Like nowadays, I'm kind of a big fan of like Twitter and things like that. Um, but, like, back then I didn't really use Facebook all that much, aside from using it for, like, uh, uh, my Lady Gear to page and things like that, but that's not important right now. Um, well, actually, that is kind of important, because there was one spot fest uh, that was announced in the game before anything was announced on social media. I don't remember which one off the top of my head, though. A lot of the caps on screen uh, whenever that appears, whenever that appears and things like that. Um, but, um, how Spotfest played itself... Only um, ranked battle modes would be closed whenever a Splatfest would happen and you'd only be able to play in Turf Wars. I understand some people were a little annoyed by this because um, they wanted to be able to play the other multiplayer modes and they'd get sick of Turf Wars after a long period of time. And the thing is, um, in normal gameplay, the stage rotations would change every four hours. But during Splatfest, um, you'd have three stages rather than two, but it would stay like that throughout the entire game. So... Um, this is something that I didn't particularly like because it made playing the game a bit repetitive over time. So this is one of the reasons. This is one of the complaints I have against Splatfest. Um, but Splatoon 2 fixes this because um, you're able to play Salmon Run if it's open during Splatfest, so you can play that if you want. Um, if you want to play an online multiplayer mode, but you didn't particularly want to play Tor Fours. Uh, hopefully at some point we'll have like a ranked battle Splatfest. Like I think it would be really cool if um, there was a Splatfest for like Splat Zones versus Rainmaker. I know I'm not saying Tower Patrol because we all know my opinions of that one, and I think that one would lose by a landslide. 
Um, if, that did, if that did appear in a Splatfest and it did win, that would confirm a lot of people's theories that Splatfest were broken. <laughs> And speaking of how Splatfest results happened, were calculated, and that was a very terrible transition, um, this is how Splatfest uh, results were calculated. The popularity percentage plus the win percentage times a 6 would equal the final score. And the thing about this is that, well, okay, well, first of all, George, the beginning of Splatfest actually being a thing, it used to be times uh, two, and then it was changed to times four, and then times uh, six. We'll get more in detail about that in a moment. Um, but there were a couple problems with this, and there were a lot of people who did not believe that popularity should even be considered. I personally think that it was a good idea to have popularity considered, but I don't think it was handled properly. What I mean by that is that um, there would be times where a team would be so popular that they would never be able to face the other team. And the thing is, if, say, Team Cali had the most popular vote, well, actually, no, Team Marie had the most popular vote, I know what I'm saying. Uh, let's use Team 2, for example. Ketchup has uh, the most popularity during the Ketchup vs. Mayo Splatfest. But because there are so many people who were on that team, it made it impossible for them to really face the mayonnaise players. And the thing is, and this is a big problem in my personal opinion, you're, if you two teams on the same side are playing against each other, that is not counted towards a Splatfest total. I think this is a really terrible idea, and I think it should count, because then... Otherwise, as, as a certain other Let's Player put it, it made it kind of a reverse popularity contest. There were a couple of Splatfests where this didn't really apply, um, but it was kind of annoying to only face the same team over and over again, and never being able to play a match that actually contributed to the actual Splatfest. So, that was a problem that I personally had with it, I know a lot of people out there did. I'm not sure if Splatoon 2 will fix this. Splatoon 2 is a Splatfest system, is a lot better than this game. Um, I'll talk about that at some point in the future. Um, but, going back into the, reward, the rewards for this game, you would get Super Sea Snails, depending on how much you contributed and whether or not your team won. Um, there would be a couple of different tiers for winning. You'd start off as a... Uh, team fanboy or fangirl, then you move up to team fiend with uh, whenever you got a uh, spot fest experience. How spot fest experience works is you'd get that for like winning and th in general things like that, like bas basic experience of the game stuff. But uh, moving on, you'd move, you'd rank up uh, to a team defender with 35 uh, total experience. Um, with 85 total experience, you become a champion, and with 184 total experience, you become a team king or queen. I think I only became a, um, I don't think I only got the highest tier like once, and that was during the final spot fest. We'll talk about that next episode. Um, but the amount of super C snails you got also depended on uh, whether or not your team won and uh, how high your rank was. Um, if if you were a fanboy fangirl and you won, you'd get four Super Sea Snails, and you'd get two if you lost them. Uh, team Fiends uh, would get six Super Sea Snails if, you won if they won, and three if they lost them. Team Defenders would get ten if they win, five if they lose. Um, team Champions would get sixteen if they win, ten if they lose. And uh, uh, Team King Queens uh, will get uh, twenty-four if they win, and eighteen if they lose. Um, so, yeah, after Splatfest ended, they changed it around to where... Um, after a certain period of time and you continuously playing through the online multiplayer mode, you can go talk to Judd or Jude or however you pronounce his name. You can go talk to him and you get Super Seasonals that way. Um, Splatfest was a much better system, but I understand why they had to change it because they were over because they were developing Splatoon 2 and Splatoon 2 was awesome. So, now let's talk about uh, the actual themes for these Splatfests. Now I'm going to be talking about every single one of them. I won't really go into detail over who won and things like that. Um, if you want, I'll uh, have it in the description below or however I'm going to handle that. Um, but first of all, let's talk about the American Splatfest themes. When the percentage was calculated by winning times two, it will, there would be cats vs. dogs and roller coasters vs. water slides. After this point, winning percentages were changed to be calculated times four. 
within the spot fest there were marshmallows versus hot dogs and autobots versus decepticons this one's pretty special because it's the first kind of promotional spot fest this one was used to promote transformers and this was actually the first spot fest that i did not participate in at all because i don't want to sound too mean but i don't care about transformers like at all <laughs> Um, after that, uh, there was Art vs. Science and Cars vs. Planes. Um, after that, Splatfest, the win percentage was changed again to times a 6. So after this was Pirates vs. Ninjas, uh, Burgers vs. Pizza, Naughty vs. Nice, Past vs. Future, and another promotional Splatfest uh, for Pokemon Red and Pokemon Blue. And then there was a Snowman vs. Sandcastle, SpongeBob vs. Patrick, which is the first Splatfest I recorded, which I mentioned already. Um, this was obviously to promote SpongeBob SquarePants, uh, and after this uh, was Fancy Party versus Costume Party. This one was pretty special because it promoted Nintendo's uh, first uh, online game, Meetimo. And one thing I want to say about Meetimo right now is uh, I see journalists all the time claiming Super Mario Run was Nintendo's first online game. Um, was <laughs> that'd be really terrible if that was the first online game? No. Uh, let's see a lot of journalists claiming that Super Mario Run was Nintendo's first mobile game. But Meetimo came out before that. Why do everybody why does everybody forget about that game? Like, I don't know. Um, but anyway, I don't know about that because uh, the spot fest after that was Earlier Bird vs. Night Owl. This one was pretty unique because uh, this was uh, the spot fest team that had the most popularity worldwide. The, um, team Owl was the most popular Splatfest team in the history of anything ever. So that's something that's pretty interesting. And then there was the final Splatfest at Worldwide, which was Cali vs. Marie. We'll be saving our discussions for this until the next episode, because there are a lot of things that are unique about this one. Next up are the Splatfest that appeared in Europe and Oceania. Um, the first was Rock vs. Pop and Eating vs. Sleeping. After that, uh, the win percentage was changed to times four. There was North Pole versus South Pole, Singing versus Dancing, Messy versus Tidy, and Cats versus Dogs. After that, win percentages was uh, changed to two times six. There was Zombies versus Ghosts, uh, Pro Pineapple versus Anti Pineapple. This one is very interesting because this actually references Blizzard Two. Um, there is a point in the game where you can talk to Mary in Octal Canyon. One of her things of dialogue says that. Um, so you could go for some anti- some pineapple-free pizza. This directly references this Splatfest, and I think that's just awesome. Um, but after that, uh, there was uh, Fit vs. Rich, or uh, Perfect Body vs. Perfect Brain, however you want to word it. Um, and then there was Pokemon Red vs. Pokemon Blue. The Pokemon Splatfest was, was I believe, worldwide as well. Um, and then after that, there was Silverboard vs. Jetpack, Spongebob vs. Patrick, a Black Tie event vs. Fancy Dress Party, World Tour vs. Space Adventure, and of course, Galley Marie. And now, let's discuss Japanese Splatfest. Now, the thing about North America and Europe and Oceania is that the North American ones had some promotional Splatfest. Um, um, Europe and Oceania didn't really get any unique ones, like, at all. And the thing is, Japan got... A lot of really cool promotional Splatfests. First of all, this was Rice vs. Bread. Second was Red Fox vs. Green Tanuki. This one is unique because there is an actually a red, there are statues of a fox and a tanuki in Inkopolis Plaza. Their colors would actually change depending on the Splatfest theme, which is pretty cool. Now, this one in particular is pretty interesting because. First of all, this is the first promotional Splatfest, I think, ever. I might be wrong about that. Um, but this one promoted instant Roman noodles. We'll get more about the. We'll talk more about this Splatfest in particular in a moment. But next up, this was after the the win percentage was changed to times four. There was lemon tea versus milk tea. This was to promote a beverage company in Japan known as Kirin. Now, I do apologize if I mispronounce some of these Japanese names. I don't speak Japanese, so I'll, I may be pronouncing some of these wrong, so please forgive me. Next up was Grasshopper vs. Ant, Boke vs. Tsukumi, Squid vs. Octopus. So this was to promote a restaurant chain in Japan known as uh, Kura Zushi. Again, I apologize if I'm butchering these pronunciations. <laughs> Um, but after that, the win percentages was changed in time 6. There was Love vs. Nani, Mountain Food vs. Seafood. This was to promote something that was very interesting about Japan. Um, this was to promote Sega Ken. Now, 
It took a little bit of research to figure out exactly what this was, but basically this was like a festival in Japan, and Nintendo helped uh, host this with uh, Saga with the Saga Prefecture, however you pronounce it. So, yeah, it was really cool that Nintendo hosted this uh, um, with another company and things like that. And they basically use this as a way to promote their Splatfest. They did a lot of things to promote Splatfest, which we'll be talking about over the course of this video. Um, but after that, uh, there was, again, Red Fox vs. Green Tanuki. This is, as far as I know, the only Splatfest in the game to appear twice. So, hopefully this means we'll get a sign of a Cali vs. Mary rematch, because, let's be honest, that totally deserves a rematch, because that Splatfest was rigged! I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, next up was uh, Perfect Body vs. Perfect Brain, and then Pokemon Red vs. Pokemon Blue. And then after that was something that was pretty interesting, was Go All Out versus Focus on Healing. This is a direct reference to the Dragon Quest series. I believe this is the only Splatfest to promote another Vital Game series. So I thought that was pretty cool that they did that. And next up is uh, Tuna Mayone's Onigiri versus Red Salmon Onigiri. Uh, this is to promote uh, Seven Eleven in Japan. And then next up was Fancy Party versus Costume Party to promote Mitomo. You all know the drill by now. And uh, there was uh, Mushroom Mountain, uh, Mushroom Mountain versus Bamboo Pursuit Village, which was to promote uh, a company called Mizey, um, a company that makes uh, snack foods and things like that. And of course, Cali versus Marie. So that's pretty much everything that I want to discuss about Splatfest themselves. Um, now let's talk about what would actually change inside the game when you played these. Um, all the stages had a nighttime version in them. They were only available during Splatfest. Now, a part of me hopes that they release an update at some point in the future that lets us play through these normally because these are so pretty, but I know it's never going to happen because they moved on to Splatoon 2, but... Yeah, they're never going to do that. Um, but the nighttime stages looked really pretty, and they were really cool and things like that. Incompetence Plaza would also change in the nighttime as well, and you'd have Inklings dancing as uh, Callie Marie performed a concert. And Callie Marie's dance for the Splatfest song is, like, the most adorable thing ever. And what I also really like uh, on topic of Squid Sisters is the music they will play during Splatfest as well. Because... Um, the song that you hear during normal Splatfest, I believe it's called Ink Me Up. This is my personal favorite song in Splatoon, outside of the obvious uh, Calamari and Contason, which we'll be talking about at some point in the future, even though we've already heard it in the game. I have a very specific reason why we're going to be talking about it again. Now, even though you cannot see the multiplayer stages at nighttime anymore, you can still see Inkopolis Plaza at night because it's in the released a Cali Marie amiibo that would allow you to activate the Splatfest version of, of the Inkopolis Plaza. They would play some different songs and they'd have some dance moves that would be exclusive to these amiibos. Um, we'll be going more over that in the next episode. Um, but I'm really glad that this lived on in some way, because Nighttime Inkopolis was one of the coolest things ever. And that was pretty much everything that I wanted to say about Splatfest, so the next episode will be the finale. Next time, we'll be discussing the Kali vs. Marie Splatfest. So, thank you guys so much for watching this episode of Splatoon, and until next time, Lead Gear to you.